So we're going to start the afternoon sessions. We're going to change gears after everybody sits down. And we're going to switch from talking a lot about our organization that we've talked about very extensively and very brilliantly this morning. I've been informed by Jason that there were more than 2,000 people watching on the live stream, which is really incredible. So congratulations to, uh, to uh, Dan and the organizers and our social media team teaching us the power of, of the message. In 2008, I wrote an application to the American College of Surgeons to take one of the ACS Health Policy Scholarships. Um, and I felt a little bit like Leanne and was, um, was rejected and didn't earn the scholarship. In, in 2009, I wrote what I thought was a, a better letter about why I would like to do this uh, scholarship and um, was rejected. Um, but I really believed in the program and I thought that it would be a great opportunity to, uh, for SAGES to offer scholarships. And so we offered scholarships, but I felt that because I, of, of the position, I didn't want to be in the running for a SAGES scholarship. But I had a chance to read the applications that were coming in, and I realized that my own letter was poor. I had written it well, Mark, but I didn't write really on the, on the right message. And so I learned, and I wrote a better uh, essay and was the 2010 ACS Health Policy Scholar. And I took this course led by people that are going to speak today, including Stuart Altman and John Chilingerian, and was so really blown away by the experience. I said, well, not only do sages need to give one scholarship, we should give two scholarships um, for this. And so it's an extraordinary pleasure to invite um, these speakers, their, their friends, and we'll go into a little bit more of that. Um, as the afternoon goes by. But one of the real opportunities of the Brandeis course, and I would uh, take this as an opportunity to um, uh, not just uh, donate to SAGES because it's a good thing to do, but one of the things that the foundation funds are the Brandeis scholarships. So if you're watching online, you, can, you too can help fund the foundation um, as well. And I had a chance to uh, step out of my day job and really think about these issues. And when I had the chance to sit in a room with uh, Stuart Altman at the lecture podium. I really thought it was a, a transformative experience. He's the, the Chaikin Professor of National Health Policy. <clears throat> He's been the advisor to more presidents than I have fingers on my hand, um, and is not afraid to say what he thinks, even if it's um, not the most popular local position. And I think that we need this. We need the loyal opposition, people just trying to make healthcare better. And so it's a pleasure to invite to the podium Dr. Stuart Altman from the Heller School at Brandeis. Stuart. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I usually don't like to stand in front of, behind podiums. I tend to disappear, but uh, I have no choice. So if uh, th there's a head here, I'm up here. Um, so listen, first, I, I, I really, uh, for, how many alums do we have here from our, the break? oh, wow. You know, it, for those of us who've been teaching a lot in undergraduate and graduate, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to join with you in the surgeons program. And now we have, and I'll let John, our fearless leader when it comes to this program, talk about our EMBA. Big, it gives me an, a, a wonderful opportunity to sort of dialogue back and forth, and I try even to stay over and meet with the scholars uh, at dinner. So thank you for all taking the time and joining us for at least a week, if not some of you are in the, our two-year program, which we do online and, and in person. Anyway, as uh, my job here is to try to give you my best shot at where I see our healthcare delivery system going. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to start off um, with an apology. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, a couple of things. I just spent some time in Europe, and, um, and then I gave one of these webinars to a hospital group in Saudi Arabia, of all places. And what I'm seeing is that some of the big issues 
sort of are affecting all of the health systems. So I just listed them here. The, the one that I'm going to issue my apology on is the growing recognition that even though you guys and women are all doing a wonderful job, and, and uh, I want to make it very clear that if you get me under the sheets, I expect you to continue to do that wonderful job. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, but that when we talk about health, health for a broad population, as I'm going to show you in a minute, health services are not the dominant reasons why some populations are more healthy than others. So the good news, bad news for you guys is that you can go to sleep at night and know that, um, that, they're, that you're not totally at fault. Now, for somebody like me, who has been spent more than 50 years in this, this comes as a deep shock because, you know, for most of my career, I took great uh, delight in speaking before physicians group and blaming you for the fact that you were not doing as good a job as you should. So I can't do that anymore. So it comes as a bit of a downplay, so I have to be nicer. But then again, I'm falling apart, so I care a lot more about you than I used to. <laughs> uh, the biggest job I, I think I had in health policy, I was 32 years old, and I didn't give a damn about you. But now I care so much. <laughs> so don't take anything personal that I'm about to say. Because I'm going to talk about the second one, which is when all gets said and done, every health system, whether it's in Europe and the United States, is really fueled by the money that goes in. We're talking about the system being fueled by the money and <clears throat> the resources that it has. A couple of years ago, I got a call from, a, I think it was a young woman, sounded like a young woman on the phone. and. It really sounded like a young woman when she said to me, you know, I've been, you know, not unlike a number of reporters, she said to me, why are healthcare costs going up? So I proceeded to give her a 45, I was fantastic. I, I sort of laid it out just beautifully and, you know, with all the nuances about what's going on in costs, you know, you have to make this and you have to make that. And, and I, towards the end of the, my dialogue here, because she was very quiet. I, I said, you know, when all gets said and done, um, if you really want to, so first of all, let's talk not about costs, let's talk about spending. And really, if you want to uh, 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 spend less, you got to spend less. And I just, I, I've, but that was the end of 45 minutes. So the next day, of course, I eagerly went to the New York Times to see if the article was there, and sure enough, it was. But as often happens, my 45 minutes was shrunk to a half a sentence. And it basically, is, Professor Altman says, if you want to spend less money, spend less money. And that was it. <laughs> At that point in my career, uh, I used to have my name Googled, which meant any time I had my name, I would come up. I don't do that anymore. And the reason why I don't do that, I got this Google back and said, that was the dumbest quote they had ever read. <laughs> I, I, well, first of all, I think it's right. So I'm not prepared to back away because we need to talk about what's happening in terms of the future flow of dollars. And then, But on top of that, of course, every society is facing the fact that on one side, as I'm going to show you, there's less resources coming along. But we have an aging population. I'm living proof of that. And um, which is going to make, and we're going to make increasing demands on it. And... As I'm also going to talk about, we need to talk about actually spending more money on non-institutional services, whether it's at home or in post-acute care. And then finally, of course, the cost of new drugs and technologies. Just The good news is they're coming online, and they're going to help me to live to 125. The bad news is they're going to bankrupt us all in the process. So these overarching themes just don't go away. So let me just spend this two minutes on these issues of social factors. It's fairly new for those of us who've been in this field for a long time that um, the idea that when you look at the, what impacts population health, 
not individual health, but population health. Now, this particular chart, I got an easy one because I had to do it myself. When I have to do slides, they tend to be simple. But if you really want to, there, there must be a hundred different definitions of social determinants. But they all sort of indicate about the same, which is about 20% of population health can be directly attributed to the healthcare system and the quality of health. Behavioral factors, social economic factors, physical environment ha have a much larger impact. And, in, and I guess when you think about it, you'd agree with that. Um, but what was really interesting was a couple of years ago, a, uh, a, a now a graduate student um, at uh, Harvard Business School, uh, Laura Taylor, and her colleague put together this chart <clears throat> because, as I said, we in the United States and people like me have been looking at the following chart for years, which shows that that black line, which is the amount of spending that comes on health care in the United States um, as a percentage of our income, is by far the largest in the world. All the rest of the so-called industrial countries are sort of squished together at that point, originally between 8 and 10 percent, where we're up over, well, this only, I'll show you more, but this only went through 2012. And so we were blasting, we, people like me, non-real physicians, were sort of saying, you guys are getting so much money, we're giving you everything you want, and why aren't you doing a better job? But what we didn't know was this chart, which is when you combine what is being spent on health care, which is what, what is being spent on social care, and compare the United States to these other countries, we're not spending more. You take a country like France, which is only spending about 12% of its GDP on healthcare, but spending 21% on social issues. Sweden, or Switzerland, or Germany, Netherlands. So the interesting aspect of this chart is that if we're going to improve the health of the population, we gotta get that nine up. And we basically have two choices. We can either add more money or we can start taking from the 16. And I'm not sure th this country is prepared to add more money. And so the question is gonna be, going forward, if we're gonna improve the health of our population, can or should we be taking some of the money that is traditionally gone to, to health services in that 16, and which is now 18? So I wanna talk about that. I, you know, I don't have any problem personally in adding to the nine because I think it's going to be very hard to take it away from the 16 because there are a lot of populations that don't even feel they're getting enough. So let me go through this. Even though we are on the top of that list, what I'm going to talk about is going forward, the growth in spending for health care in the United States is going to slow. Look at this chart. Between 2000 and 2005, percent of growth in spending was 48 percent. That declined almost in half between 2005 and 2010, and it's declined further between 2010 and 2015. And I'm going to talk about what's happening since then. So why is healthcare spending declining? And what we see is something that you know, but let's play this one out, is that the growing percentage of the population which is insured, covered by government, whether it's through the aging population in Medicare or the low-income population in Medicaid. <clears throat> so before the passage of the Affordable Care Act, Medicare and Medicaid covered about 29% of the U.S. population. And you can see it in this pie chart. With the passage of the Affordable Care Act, the growth has grown to 36%. 
Now, even going forward, look at this chart. The growth in enrollment in payer source. Look at Medicare and Medicaid compared to private. Essentially, there is no growth on the private side. Almost all the growth in enrollment into these programs, these are new people coming online, is going to be in our government programs. Now, why is that important? We have been tracking for a long time how different payer groups pay. And this one is for hospitals. And, um, you know, I go back to actually the passage of Medicare and Medicaid and found my, I wasn't there at the signing, but in late 1969, 70, I wound up having a fairly high level position in government. And for those of you who have your doubts about government and, and concern about whether government should control your health system, I am living proof on why you are justified. Because when I had all this power, I knew from nothing about health care. And I like to say this, I'm a little nervous about saying it in this group. Next to surgeons, ec economists are the most arrogant people you're going to meet. So I said, I don't know anything about health care, but I can run this system. I mean, what do I need to know? just like you guys. I'm proud to be part of you. <laughs> so, but I was 33 years old. So the good news is I know a lot more, but I'm not 33. The bad news is if you go to Washington, they're still 33 year olds. It's just not me. <laughs> so, so we, we, but the early 70s, was a time when Medicare and Medicaid, by the way, were committed to pay hospitals their costs. And if you look in terms of, you know, Medicare was never a fantastic payer, but for most of the 70s, 80s, even into the early 90s, Medicare paid hospitals on average the cost of the care of the populations they serve. But since roughly 1996, look what's happened. Aside from that little blip up there in early 2000, we're now on average at 85%. Now, it's not that hospitals are losing money on the average Medicare patients. They're still making more than their marginal costs. But in terms of the average costs, no longer is Medicare such a great payer. As a result, most hospitals will say that they lose money. And you can see it in this chart. The average hospital in the United States, in, in sort of orange, lost 7 a little over 7% in 2015. Urban hospitals actually lost more. Rural hospitals did better, and the ones that did the best, by the way, are what we call these small rural hospitals, um, which are no longer being paid on the DRG system. But anyway, the point is that we have seen hospitals make money, and of course, the big teaching hospitals uh, thanks to uh, the DRG payment system, used to make money hand over fifth on the DRG system. That's not true anymore. So the world has changed. Now, don't, don't, next time you walk into the hospital, don't deposit your paycheck and help them out because they really don't need it yet. Because the truth of the matter is that most hospitals continue to make money thanks to higher payments from private insurance. Now, I'm sure none of you go to sleep at night, and before you go to sleep, say your prayers to your local insurance company. I'm, I'm sure there's at least, but maybe you should. Because if it wasn't for the amount that's coming from private insurance, when I speak before them, I call them the great ATM machine in the sky. The private insurance payments to hospitals and doctors, but more to hospitals, has grown so fast and is in fact shielding the healthcare system, particularly hospitals, but physicians as well, from these cutbacks that I was just talking about. <clears throat> we, we got a few Massachusetts people, I'm sure. We're, we're sort of towards the bottom of the list. We're probably running at about 80% above Medicare. Those of you, we got any Californians here? 
You're you you've won the race. I think you're someplace between 150 and 200 percent. So the you're gonna. Uh, I don't want to say anything. Dr. Chorciano is going to be here a little while, and he showed me a chart, and I buy it, where the UCSF um, was 150 percent, which was a couple of years ago, and we're nowhere near that. I was talking to a group in New York recently, and New York is like about 125. In other words, the average payment from a privately insured patient is 120, they're getting on, adjusted for the complexity of the patient, 125% more than what Medicare pays for the same kind of patient. People have no idea what's funding our system anymore. Just to show you, I get equally in trouble with different populations. Recently, I spoke before a group of very pro um, a population that wants single payer, and they were also older. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, you have no idea what you're talking about. If all of a sudden that 175 to 200% went away, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars would disappear from the healthcare system. So we have a very interconnected system. And it's not like Medicare is by itself or Medicaid is by itself. When it gets to the end of the day, the hospitals mix all the money. People who are chief financial officers, you think they learn financial accounting and management information that John, what they learn is how to take their little cups and run from spigot to spigot to get as much money out of the system. That's their job. And the bigger the spigot, the more money they can collect. So look at where we go. So <clears throat> as I, you show, I showed you what was happening to Medicare margins, all on the negative. The average margins of hospitals in 2015 was among the highest we had seen, even during the cutbacks in the Affordable Care Act. So the good news is that hospitals that you work in are not suffering from lack of money. The not so good news is going forward, we're beginning to see those monies being cut back. If you take 2016, which is the latest numbers we really have, expenses are growing um, faster than income, and, and we're gonna, and you can see it in this chart. Operating margins, which is the amount coming in and out, which was at 4.3, I showed you seven, but that includes the amount of money they were making on investments and the parking garage and the Cronolas that they sell, whatever. So the average was 4.3. In 2016, it was almost cut in half to 2.7, and my sense is in 2017, the number is even gonna be lower. <clears throat> now, let me spend a little time on your life. Obviously, physician payments face similar kinds of issues. And if, the, if you, you need to go no further to try to, than try to figure out what, what's going on in this crazy new macro system, every time, you know, I, I've been accused of coming up with some wacko type plans, but by comparison to the new group, I was a piker. Who in their right mind would have created this system? The only worse system was the system it, it, it took its place from. I mean, and I would like to say I did that, but I didn't. But the people I know that, you know, we're talking about the sustainable growth rate. Remember that one? <laughs> so MACRA, I'm not going to go into, you know, has created these two programs. And, you know, so I'm not a, a, a MACRA super expert. But I kept trying to find out was, what does MIPS stand for? Only in government would they hyphenate merit-based because they realized if they just had MBI, it wouldn't make any sense. So they created one word out of two. But so, so now I know the reason what MIPS is is merit-based incentive program. 
But, of course, it's really merit-based incentive program. Anyway, the point is, when you look at this chart, you're talking about the average physician payment growing by $2 between 2014 and 2024. Essentially, a flat amount of money. But that isn't the story. For those of you who choose not to move into the so-called APM, the advanced payment uh, mechanism systems, you're talking about the potential for either going above that two up to 4% or 5% or up to 9% in 2022 or losing up to 9%. Look at this chart. What MACRA is talking about is that, well, on average, the growth will be $2. Over this period of time, it can grow up to $111 or down to $93. Now, they, you know, they took a fine look at this and said, well, wait a minute, this is a little tough. So they added a few bucks in a little exceptional performance. The point is that when you look at this chart, and by the way, Everything that is on the upside has to be counterbalanced on the downside. The point I'm trying to make is the same set of issues are affecting the physician payment side as are affecting the hospital side. So the question is, going forward as physicians and working in hospitals, how are you going to deal with this problem? It's not going away. And by the way, it has nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act. We're talking about the fact that we're getting older and poorer, which means one way or the other, government is going to be insuring a greater percentage of the population. And there's no way in this world that you're going to get government payments to change much. I recently had a bit of a to-do. At one point in my career, I ch chaired what was called PROPAC, which was the group set up to create the DRG and implemented, and I did that for a dozen years. But now we have a new group. It's called MedPAC. And if you really want to understand government think, read their report. So I got into a to-do with the executive director, a good guy, very smart guy. And I basically said to him, if you're not careful, you're going to turn Medicare into Medicaid. You just, but he didn't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. So we're going to have to live with this. And the question is, you're going to have to live with it. And if you have to live with it, I have to live with it because I don't like you coming into the operating room scrowling and concerned about the fact that you'll have to go on the bread line. That is not a great feeling for the patient. So we have to figure out a way for, for our system to function in this. So what are, what are we going to talk about? We need... We do need to figure out a way to sort of get the delivery system to become more efficient, lower costs, and to take those lower costs and share the savings between hospitals and doctors on the one side and the government or on the private payers on the other. And that's what this is all about. How do we shift more and more of the patient population, more and more physicians, to move towards these new types of delivery systems. Because that's the way f physicians of the future are going to be able to have a decent growth through forms of gain sharing to get above that one point, a dollar two or two dollars. <clears throat> now, we now call the new organizations accountable care organizations. It's a much more sophisticated way. And it, you know, we don't like to talk about capitation and managed care because it brings up these awful pictures of the 1990s. But the reality of it is what we're talking about is moving away from fee-for-service, developing some overarching payment global payments, we call them, but they're really capitated amounts, to the system, and then to the extent that the system that can provide this population with decent medical care for less, sharing those savings. So we need you as physicians 
to sort of work w with the system, work, you know, I, I hate to say this, you gotta work with your hospitals. I know you don't love them all the time, but I don't know any alternative. Look what's happening in Medicare. So if you take Medicare, it's split into two parts now. We have a growing percentage of Medicare beneficiaries are in Medicare Advantage, upwards of almost a third, but still two thirds are in traditional Medicare. Within that, that big circle represents almost $100 billion, which are now in some form of ACOs. And then there are all these other little ditties, the you know, bundle payments. Now, I happen to be a believer in bundle payments, and I think it was a big mistake that um, the former secretary, Dr. Price, didn't like bundle payments. I think bundle payments are much easier, and they really are much more pro-specialists and much more pro-surgeons. So if I was you, I would take a hard look at bundle payments as a way of getting it back on the agenda. I think it's a much more supportive for uh, in-hospital-based specialists, particularly surgeons, because it allows you to do your thing. We can talk about that offline, but right now, it's not in the ascending seat, but ACOs continue to be. <clears throat> and then on the bottom, of course, is MACRA as a growing part of the deal. So traditional Medicare is really fundamentally being restructured. What happens to Medicare Advantage is sort of up for grabs. And it's all over the map, depends on where you live and how your Medicare Advantage plan. So there's no one Medicare Advantage plan. You know, I'm not gonna spend much time. I mean, I, I have one of my colleagues, one of the professors that talks to you, Rob Mechanic, and you know, he, he sort of lives and dies thinking about MACRA. And, but it's constantly changing. I think this administration's gonna take a hard look at it again. I would suspect they're gonna to try to simplify it, reduce the amount of quality measures. But, you know, if you look there, the current expectation is that in order to qualify for these new types of delivery, you have to have an activity which has at least 25% of Medicare patients in the Part B program as part of it. And then as you move forward in time, you're gonna see more options. The important thing is that we need you guys to, to sort of take a you know, hard look and try to make it work. And it involves things like care management, continuity of care, coordination, patient caregivers. In other words, it requires a different focus than just traditional healthcare. It does require the organization to think more broadly about the population. Now, here's the kicker, and I've talked to many of you. There is no way of running an organization like this without getting some buy-in and agreement between physicians and hospitals. And it depends on which hospital you're in and which physician group. I know the amount of concern that if the money goes to the hospitals, the amount of money that will trickle down to the physicians is going to be pretty Mickey Mouse. On the other hand, the hospitals are being told one way or the other, you can't play that game anymore. Because if you're not in sync with your physicians, your whole program is going to fail. Now, with that said, one of the key groups in the ACO movement, of course, are primary care physicians. So somewhere along the line, you guys have to deal with them on a more equal basis. But the point I'm trying to make is that if we're gonna go forward and actually maintain a high quality system, we're gonna to have to do it with less revenue. And the only way we're gonna make that work is to really think hard about making our system more efficient. Now there's one little ray of good that I just wanna finish on, because I don't, and that is the amount of potential money that we can save on the post-acute side. 
One of the things that shocked everybody was when we began to look at how much money was being spent for the total flow of pay. Most of you, as surgeons, do your job, finish your job, do it right, either hug the patient or say goodbye or whatever you do, and then they leave you, and you've done your job. And you think, well, that's over. But this, it's not over. And what we are finding is the amount of money that gets spent after the patient leaves the hospital. It just blew our mind. Depends on, you know, major joint, almost 50% of the money. CHF, 70% of the money. COPD, 70% of the money. Renal failure, 70%. In other words, most of the money that's being spent by the Medicare program is after they leave you. And we know that the, that world is a world that's kind of like in Never Never Land. So one of the really positive things about true ACOs is for the first time, now it's, it started a couple of years ago, is there is actually a serious set of discussions going on between the acute care side and the post-acute. The potential savings here are huge. So if this works together, the amount of money that can come back, A to you, don't forget the social determinant side. We can't let that totally string out. So the good news is, as we begin to understand more about where the money goes and how it's spent, we have the real potential to become a, a more efficient healthcare system so that with the slowing growth, which we need to have, because I don't know what it's good, you know, I started, if you could believe it, in 1971, when this country was spending 7.5% of its GDP on health care. In my lifetime, it's gone from 7.5 and 75 billion to 18% and 3.2 trillion. It can't keep growing like that. So my plea to you is to work with your hospitals, work with your other physician groups, and help make our health care system more efficient. Thank you very much. We're going to take questions at the um, at the end. Um, it's a uh, it's a privilege to welcome back to the Sages Leadership Retreat, uh, Dr. John Chilingerian. For those of you who've been around for a while, this is not John's first trip to the uh, Sages Board meeting because we had him here in 2012 when he led a session on on leading change. And if you do get a chance to go to the to the Heller course, one of the Then we will change plans. We're gonna have a change of plans. We're we're gonna be show, remember we said we were nimble. We're about to be nimble. So, uh, Dr. Altman can't stay for the Q and A. So I'm gonna give people who have an opportunity to ask questions to come up to the uh, microphones now. And uh, here's a chance to come up and ask your your questions. So uh, Paresh, I know you're eager to get up. I, I knew you wouldn't miss this opportunity. And we're gonna we're gonna give uh, Stuart a chance to uh, ask questions uh, now. And while he's doing that, I'm gonna do what Joe said she wanted to do and send her a picture, even though it's not quite the same, and take all of your guys' uh, pictures. But uh, go ahead, Presh. Thanks, Steve. Stu, good to see you again. John, I'm looking forward to hearing you talk again. You know, this is a really challenging topic and your statements are both, I think, true and, and provocative. There are a number of challenges to this that I think need to be thought about and certainly by our colleagues here in the audience. I think you're absolutely right that the social determinants of health care are more important. Part of our problem is our terminology. What we provide in our hospital and physician system is illness care, not health care. So we need to think about health maintenance and illness care, which is what we actually do. We subsidize illness, illness care in our current system and we do it fairly poorly. MIPS as an economic tool will essentially cut the bottom out from half of the physicians who are participating in it intentionally because that's what the economists designed it to do. Uh, so if you're stuck with going to MIPS and don't have an APM available to you, you're either going to have to do really well, but by the curve, half the people on the curve won't do well enough and will lose money. 
So you're forced into a, an alignment with the hospitals, which if we think about this from a global policy level, makes sense. All of the components of the delivery system for illness care should be aligned and should be coordinated. But when we push the hospital systems to do that, we have to recognize that in our country today, many of the hospital systems that are taking on this burden, including ACOs or other forms of at-risk contracting, are woefully unprepared for what that actually means. I was recently consulting for a healthcare system in the Midwest that has 21 hospitals and doesn't even have cost-based accounting. They don't know what their cost structure is, and yet they're taking on an at-risk contract from the government for delivering wellness management, which is what ACOs are really delivering, and not able to do it. And so when you ask for physicians to participate in a line, and, and they have to, look, the practical reality is that private practice is dying on the vine because individual practitioners can't do it. But how do we address the challenge of the unprepared and ill-prepared delivery system, which is the hospital or health system that doesn't actually have the data infrastructure to analyze and manage what they're taking on for risk? Well, first of all, I, I could, you know, you, I don't, is it on? You know, I think you've laid it out extremely well, but, you know, I, I guess I see a different side of the coin, and I spent a fair amount of time with health systems now, um, and maybe I spend too much time here in Massachusetts, but I try to get around the country. And I, w I would say that at least the top third, if not the top half of our healthcare system is much closer to being prepared. I mean, we've spent billions and billions of dollars um, and mo you know, uh, in, in building up that little company in Wisconsin called Epic. God, you know, I mean, you ever meet her, Judy? I mean, what a force. Anyway, um, so the, the, we, you know, and, and of course, half of you, I think, would like to wring her neck, um, if not three quarters of you. <laughs> but the point is that that information or the, all of those information systems are really going to help make the system much know much more about what you said. So I'm not so pessimistic about the system, uh, the capacity. Sure, the, the, you know, if you take the bottom quartile, they're not in any shape to do it, but we don't need to start with them. If we start with the, you know, most of our systems, which is where most of you are practicing, I think we can make tremendous pride. And I showed you that slide. In fact, we, they are moving in that direction. The concerns I have, which I didn't talk about, is that in a lot of places, the ACO movement is stalling. Part of it is that no one knows what's going to happen, and I don't blame you for st stalling because given the craziness going on in Washington and the reluctance on the private side to do anything. But the point is I'm less worried about the capacity of the, yeah, we'll, you know, I help create the DRG system. None of this falled or all. We, the government basically said to the healthcare community and the hospitals, you got one year and none of this business about volunteerism and if you don't save money, you can drop out. You had one year and damn it, you did it. And we are a different healthcare system in, by 1985 than we were in 1980. So um, you, if you guys all work with your hospitals, we can get it done. And the point is, my, the, the, the bottom line is you have no choice. We got to make it work. Introduce yourself at the, at the microphone. Hi, Rob Catania from Manchester, New Hampshire. So you finished up by saying that you know, we are all responsible for making the system more efficient. Um, but I would argue that I have no idea how efficient or inefficient I am right now. I have no idea how to measure any of that <coughs> because costs and charges and reimbursements are so opaque to me that all I do every day is come to work and do my best for the patient and hope that it doesn't cost too much. So how can we get the information to the physicians to be more f efficient if, honestly, I don't even know if the hospital administration knows how much things cost. So, so first of all, uh, you know, I mean, I'm speaking before you, not before them, so I'm going to say this. I say the same thing to every group. I mean, the point is, I, you're right. No one group 
and particularly groups like yours that go in and I'm sure do a decent job, worry about your patients and stuff like that, can take responsibility. So you're right, you know, given where you are in the system, but what I won't let you off the hook on is collectively, you and your colleagues can either be a force for change or a force to move backwards. And quite frankly, not you and maybe not this organization, not all physician groups have been so welcoming of change. Collectively, physicians in this country have been among the most conservative and if not reactionary. And what I'm pleading with you in a way is two things, don't do that. And what's more, if you do it, your life will be worse. But it's really not aimed at you alone. It's really aimed at the collective. And besides, if you want to know completely what you should do, you've got to take our course. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, Brian Jacob. Thank you for an amazing talk. I'm Brian Jacob from New York City, which arguably is, is in a little bubble of its own. Yeah, I, yeah that's a big bubble. Num number two, I, re I do represent the thriving private practice surgeon. Uh, so unlike Priest said, like I'm, we're doing okay. But one of the reasons we're doing okay is we dropped out of all these insurers. We dropped out of Medicare, we dropped out of United, we dropped out of Aetna. And we did that to survive. And we did that in a, in a time period where something you didn't mention existed, which is the UCR. Uh, and the third party payers used to pay based on what we'd call UCR, which meant the prices that were usual and customary varied based on zip code. Uh, I don't think anyone will deny that it costs a lot more to live in Manhattan than it does to live in other parts of the country. So we can't survive on $390 for a hernia, which is what Medicare pays. And so when you say that the third party payers are significantly paying more at 120 or 130 percent, what that means is instead of paying $390, they're paying $410. Again, you can't survive. Step two of my question is number one is which, what's happened to UCR and can we still fight for that? And the second part is when you look at what the hospitals are doing, they're starting to self-insure. And by self-insuring, what they're doing is they're basically paying themselves, which is different than an ACL. And we just saw an EOB, for instance, uh, and this is just a specific example, but it's coming where we did a hernia repair, uh, and during that period of time, they needed a CAT scan, and they needed a few other things done in an ICU stay. The hospital got paid $60,000. The radiology exam got paid $7,000, and the surgeon got $400. And this is a real EOB. Now, this is the problem that's going on. So the hospitals are still getting paid those big bucks. The doctors are being valued as almost nothing. Yeah, no, and this is right. what we need to fight for. So let me, let me, first of all, the previous speaker really laid it out right. There was a conscious, very conscious decision made to use MIPS to squeeze you out. Now, as you pointed out, and you're right on, I mean, there were, and the idea was that, uh, you know, not personal, but the reality was that the independent physician working by themselves or in small groups is really a, a thing of the past, particularly given the nature of the need to have these broader coordination. Now, <clears throat> so the fact that you're seeing squeeze down in your rates is no surprise. But I would say this. You don't necessarily, A, need to be either an employee of a hospital, which of course more and more physicians are, or part of a big group that's really part of the hospital. If you become part of a virtual, there are groups in this country, and as I was just talking to a group here in Massachusetts, that is trying to stay small, trying to stay independent because they don't want to be part of a big bureaucracy, but are linking up virtually and trying to be, to working to become part of a broader ACO without giving up that. I do believe that's a real possibility. You can't, there's just too many aspects of the new reality to a, a small physician groups can't support them. And I think the way you laid it out was right on. So, and, and that was conscious, although no one quite, you know, realized the impact that Epic was gonna have. I mean. So um, you got to figure out a way to work with these bigger groups. And I think virtual um, linkages are going to be the savior 
for those of you who want to stay as small? What we are doing in New York is meeting with our representatives yeah, to I mean, Albany and to fight for New that York is a, is a great example of that. I mean, you know, living in the shadows of those gigantic, you know, Columbia Presbyterian and the others, um, lots of luck. Thanks. Ray Price. Uh, Ray Price, Salt Lake City, uh, where my clinical work is done with Intermountain Healthcare, uh, which is a 22 hospital uh, system. Well, uh, you're, my God, I mean, you're, you're living proof of a system that really could and is already there. So, well, and that's the we question. We should all is be like we, you. We've, uh, yeah, we all want you to be like us. That's great. <laughs> um, so that, uh, that the tightening the belt, uh, Intermount Healthcare physicians really have worked closely with the, with the system to try to look at ways to tighten the belt. Uh, yes, you have. At times where uh, companies would have contracts that supposedly you couldn't tell the physicians how much everything cost, we did it anyway, and then we were able to give feedback to each of the physicians in the departments how much it cost for each of them to do like a lap coli or a lap appy, and, and all of a sudden the guy who was, you know, was taking, costing $1,200, and he looked and said, geez, somebody else is doing it for $300, what can I do differently? That led to us then developing a program that in the operating room we can actually ask how much does that various needle cost compared to that one, and, and if it really is that much better, you can use the more expensive one, but it's amazing how that saved millions of dollars by That's just exact. making that information available. My question is that despite all that, that's not going to solve all the problems. The tightening the belt isn't the whole answer, and we no, have to find right. other innovative ways. And in fact, we're being pushed more and more to the point that people are really beginning to wonder what, what else can physicians do, and what are the innovative things that we need to do beyond just tightening our belt. So first of all, thank you for what you've done. And, and if you're not on the program, you should be. Um, because what Intermountain, you know, in, in answer to the comment before, I mean, Intermountain is as, as well run as any group that I know in this country. And I think you're, you're right on. You, you do all the right things. You by yourself, I mean, even a well run system by itself is not enough. I mean, we have to gain, you know, there are a lot of parts of our 3.2 trillion dollar system that need to be controlled. You know, we, I, <clears throat> we have to deal with the cost of these new technologies. Um, the idea that um, it's going to cost a million dollars to give an injection into somebody's eye and it, maybe it's going to work and cure blindness. And, you know, I think we ought to pay a fair amount. But, so, you're right. But you know what? You can do what you can do. And Intermountain and Virginia Mason and others like that are so far ahead. They know, I'm sorry to you know, disagree, they know what those costs are. And they have pulled substantial amount of money out. But your comment is right on. That's not enough. We need, and it, in a broader sense, a a larger effort that reigns in other spending that provides very little value to our system. So you can't do it alone, but if you don't help, we won't do it. Introduce yourself from the podium. No, I'll say this, uh, Virginia Mason in Seattle. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I, I guess I wanted to kind of bring up a, the point of this shared profit in being efficient. Um, one of the issues that you know, a lot of times when we think of waste and being efficient, we think of using less, uh, uh, you know, disposable show cars and everything. But the, what I've learned in being in Virginia Mason now for six years is that a lot of the waste is actually in, in patient flow. And you, you can substantially decrease cost that way. But for us, all physicians are involved in these processes of improvement and efficiency. But we also have a shared model of actually benefiting from it. From it. So we actually get paid to actually the time what we spend in those projects. And we get benefit from the, the benefits that uh, the decrease in cost and I don't find that to be something that exists elsewhere and a lot of physicians feel like why should I spend my time being you know figuring out efficiencies and getting rid of waste if I'm not benefiting from this directly and well you're right well <laughs> um, let me play it the other way around one of the things I've learned is in the past almost none of the uh, we've been 
uh, of the efficiencies has ever come back to the patient or the people that paid the bill. So uh, one of the concerns that uh, people that are paying the bill, which are individuals or c corporations, is that A, you, the sharing should be across the board. And the thing I like about the Medicare program is there it's clear. The sharing is between the government and the delivery system. The second thing which you're talking about is within the delivery system, how much of it is shared between the different components of the delivery system. And you know what? This is not easy. And some of us in Washington dismissed it and said, oh, you'll deal with it. And I've learned now that it's a lot harder. I, I, there's no magic answer here. If the hospitals continue to take it all, you know, you're not without your own power collectively, not individually. So um, you're right. Sharing is not going to be easy. Fee-for-service was good in that way. You got, and you know, the way the government's operating, fee-for-service is going to stay. And I think the private is, so if, when we talk about global budgets, doesn't mean we do away with fee-for-service inside the system. So, um, you know, we need to talk about that. So good luck to us all. Thank you so much. You. I know yeah. John so, is Stuart, going to come. Stuart, a, a question. Um, I left uh, Tufts, which was fee-for-service, and went to Cambridge as the last public hospital in Massachusetts. And one of the things you learned pretty quickly there is that you could never keep an employee a physician if you had to live on your fee-for-service from Medicaid. Yes. And so the only way we, we survived, and there's a couple of veterans That's of that <laughs> system here, Lee Maurice, Erica was here, is that we were paid on a dollar per RVU amount, which is essentially sharing the money that the hospitals took in to achieve a rate, because when you're in when you're in Cambridge, the great sucking sound of all the great hospital systems that that pull talent, you'd have nobody. And bad surgeons are more expensive than than good surgeons. So the the impact of what we do is is very real, and the need to for surgeons to create their own leverage is is, is also very real. But in this. You say that we control a lot of our fate. So the question I'm going to put to you is, can you comment on the impact of the medical arms race on where all of this healthcare spending is? I mean, where everybody has one robot, then two robots, then a new cancer center, then another new cancer center. How much money are we spending because we are, we're, we're all trying to get another patient in the door and have the brightest and, and shiniest things. Where do, you, where do you see all that heading? Well, first of all, that's a long term, you know, the medical arms race has been going on for 40 years. But we had a, uh, a payment system that supported it. The message that I'm giving you, the payment system is shrinking and the medical arms race will not be able to, I'm not saying it's going to die, you know, it's, it, it exists and you're right, but I'm saying that the, the ability to fund that arms race is going to get harder and harder. And you know, since you live here, that even our big, most powerful, most expensive system is feeling under, under some pressure. And it's intentional and um, that, that all, of, and all of the system here in Massachusetts and around the country is going to face that. So I don't see it going away. In the 70s, we created certificate of need to get at it. It ultimately failed because the, you know, if you're concerned about the healthcare system, we have a legal system that goes banana, and the people that made all the money on certificate of need were the consultants and the lawyers. So I can't say you're wrong, because you're not, but I don't think the, the past is prologue. I do not believe that the next 20 years is going to play out the way the past 20 years, because it can't. There's just not going to be the money to do it. Now, you know, if I had my druthers, I'd go back to tougher certificate of need. I'd make a tougher, you'd have to make a stronger case for why you're adding that robot and why you're adding that new. But, you know, the politics of certificate of need is tough. So I, I'm not overly optimistic. I think we're in better shape here in Massachusetts than other parts of the country. But still, you know, as you know well, um, we get beat up. So you're not wrong. So. I wish us luck. Thanks very much. I, I'm sorry I have to catch a plane. Thank you so much, Stuart.